Okay, keep your place in Proverbs. We're going to be coming back and forth to Proverbs throughout the service. I love the book of Proverbs. You know, if I could sum up the book of Proverbs in one statement, it would be basically, you know, how to not be an idiot. You know, or I guess the biblical word is it would be a fool, how to not be a fool. There's such uh, great wisdom in the book of Proverbs. I wish I had known it um, younger in my life. I wish I would have uh, known the book of Proverbs better. Um, the part of the chapter that we're going to focus on is going to be in verse number 6, where the Bible reads, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, we're going to start the, the first installment of this sermon series called The Axis of Evil that you've been seeing in your bulletin for a couple weeks. And we're going to be talking this morning about the first installment, which is the public school system. Um, I've identified three major um, areas that I believe are, are, are greatly affecting slash destroying our country in a very successful way. Um, the first being the public school system, the second being um, liberal Christianity, and the third being, you know, the media, internet, TV, things like that, things that actually are... Um, are, are penetrating the boundaries of your home um, without you even knowing it. But first of all, this morning, we're going to talk about um, the public school system. So I hope that I can get, a, get some things across to you this morning um, in, in, a, in a timely fashion. There's a lot to talk about. Many of the things that I'm going to bring up this morning are sermon series uh, to themselves. So it's going to be, we're going to be touching on things, but I want to give you an overall view of what's happening here. And if you know me or if you get to know me better, you're going to know that I'm pretty light on conspiracy theories um, compared to a lot of people that you may meet. I'm, I'm just pretty light on, in that area. But I want to tell you this morning about a straight up conspiracy that goes all the way from the top in this world all the way to the bottom, to the people, to your children. Okay. Um, it's very real and it is very, very dangerous. And, and I hope that a lot of you who have been through public school, I went to public school, and I hope that I can see some heads nodding that I can hit on things that you know are true um, in the public school system. So first, before I get into the sermon, let me just talk to you a little bit about time. Okay, so a very wise person told me many, many years ago that it takes, when we think about time in our lives, that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert on anything. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I heard that over a decade ago by somebody, and I have found that to be absolutely true. 10,000 hours, think about it. If you think about 10,000 hours, and if you put that into the context of a 40-hour work week, that's about five years, four and a half to five years working 40 hours a week. So when you think about becoming an expert at a trade, an expert at you know, any kind of profession, you know, that's, that's pretty much what it takes is 10,000 hours to become an expert in that field. So if you're starting out, um, just a side note, if you're starting out in a trade, give it some time. You're not going to know everything in the first year or the second year. It takes a long time to learn these things. Now, training programs actually are designed for this. If you look at apprenticeship programs, things like that for whatever trade is out there, you will find that the next level, like journeyman level type things or master levels, are usually four to five years out. So this is a, a known fact, okay? So 10,000 hours to become an expert on anything. Let's look at some time, some statistics this morning. By the time children graduate from high school, they will have spent 14,000 hours in school classrooms. 14,000 hours, that's almost 1.5 times um, that 10,000 hour point. If you take that same kid and you assume that that same kid that spends 14,000 hours in the public school classroom and you take him and you assume that he goes to church in a Baptist church three times a week, from that same time that he is from K through 12, he will spend 3,000 hours in church. So here you have 14,000 hours versus 3,000 hours. Okay, so you can see that the, the public school has much, much more time with your children than you do or your church does. So the influence of time on children cannot be underestimated. That's the first point I want to make. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to talk to you this morning about the conspiracy to influence children today. Let me read you a quote. The quote I'm going to read you is from Joseph Goebbels. Hitler's minister of propaganda. And the quote goes like this. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. 
So you see why we're going to repeat Proverbs 22 and verse 6 several times this morning? Because if, you're, you know, if you repeat things, people will believe it. And in his case, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. In Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 12. You've heard this verse, but this is super important for this morning's sermon. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So we know two things here. First of all, people in high places have proven means and methods to get the population to believe what they want them to believe. These are proven means and methods. People know that they work. And second of all, we know spiritual wickedness exists in high places and perilous times shall come. And I'm here to tell you that they're here. These perilous times are here. These methods are in place and they're working. As we get closer to the end, things will get worse. But we need to understand what's happening around us. As Bible-believing Christians, you know, the Bible will tell us and show us a vision and, and show, shine light on these things that are happening in the darkness. You know, the Bible is the antidote, essentially, to this spiritual wickedness. All right? The Bible is the antidote. And those people in high places, they know this. They know that the Bible will shine the light on what they are trying to do. You say, you know, what do you mean? I'll give you some examples. The first example throughout history is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church throughout history has killed and murdered Christians for having a Bible. They would go into villages and they would find people that had a Bible and they would hunt them down and they would kill them for having a Bible. You know, the Baptist finds out that there's a couple people in a village with a Bible and they're like, why doesn't everyone in the village have a Bible? Because that's, our, that's what we want people to have because we believe that Bible. In order to put this spiritual wickedness on a population, you must get rid of the Bible. A more recent example is communism in the, in the 20th century. You know, the Soviet Union being the biggest example. The first thing that a communist government will, will always do is they will hunt down all the religious people and they will kill them. And the reason is, is because in order to successfully implement a communist system on a population, the state has to be God. The state has to be the only one that is in control and the only one that people recognize as an authority. This Bible tells me that, I have, that, that God is an authority Amen. in my life. The Bible tells me that, yes, I'm to uh, uh, you know, respect the authorities that are put over me, but the Word of God trumps anything that they say, right. always. So if I am going to come up with a government that is going to control people and go against um, the, the doctrines of the Bible, I need to get rid of the Bible. So that's, that's been implemented successfully in several nations in just the last 100 and 120 years. It, it's amazing how, how, uh, how short people's memory are. Karl Marx, who's the, the father of, of communism, Karl Marx has been, he's been described as one of the most influential figures in history, in the history of the world. And he was, he was Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin's um, philosophical teacher on the political philosophy of communism. He wrote this in his book called The Communist Manifesto. Communism is incompatible with religious faith. There you go. So they have to get rid of the religious people. They have to get rid of the Bible. So these people that are trying to push another, um, this spiritual wickedness, they must undo the Bible first. They can't have you believing in the Bible and also following their philosophies. So I'm going to show you this morning the conspiracy to steal the hearts and the minds of your children. And I hope that I can get this across to you successfully. So remember Proverbs 22, 6. The Bible's giving you a direct command there. It's giving the reader a command. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a command to you to train up your child. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's look at Moses giving a command to the children of Israel before they were go, to go into um, the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 6, the beginning of your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse number 6, the Bible says, And these words which I, which I commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest down in, thy, sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign on thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Moses is telling the people of the children of Israel that they need to teach the Bible to their children. He's worried about the next generations when they go into the promised land and things are good and all the battles are over. He's worried that they're going to forget the God that got them there. So he's giving them this warning that just teach your children. He's like, write it on the posts of your house. When you get up, teach it to them. When you, all day long, teach the Bible to your children. He's giving them a very serious warning. And if, if you read the Bible, you'll find out that you know, people just forgot about that warning. So I'm here to warn you again that we need to teach the Bible to our children. They need to be able to understand what the Bible says so when things contrary to the Bible come into their lives, when they are old, they will not depart from it. But you notice how it said, when they're old, they will not depart from it? It didn't say, when they're eight they won't depart from it. It says you trained them up so when they're old, they will not depart from it. You see, it, it's, we must train our children. Now look, this is a job that is our job as parents to do, and a lot of people want this job. A lot of people want to take this job over for us. You know, if we look at statistics of women working, you know, Titus 2.5 says that women are to be keepers at home. If we look at statistics, look at in 1900, you know, 6% of women in this country worked outside the home that had children. In 2017, what do you think that, that number is? In 2017, it's 75% of women with children at home work. If you do not work and you stay home and you raise your children, you are in the extreme minority in this country. 40% of those households, the woman is actually the sole, or the, the main provider for those house, households. It is totally flipped on its head. Look, the gates are wide open for this conspiracy to be extremely successful. Because the job that we are supposed to have, everyone in this country is saying, I don't want it. And it's not like nobody wants the job. You know, we've abandoned this job and people will take it. Someone's going to train your child, and I'm going to show you now what they are being trained. I want to show you what your kids will really learn in public school, and I hope I can get across to you that it's not as bad as you think, but it's much, much worse. And I want to show you the source of where it came from. And in the last hundred years, you know, there's been this war that has been waged on the children of this country using the public education system, and it's been largely lost in this country. It's been lost. Let me introduce you to someone. There's somebody named John Dewey. John Dewey lived from 1859 to 1952. He's known as the father of progressive education. He's remembered for his efforts establishing the current educational systems of this country. He's had huge influence on what you would call the public school system in America. He was also a prominent member of the American Humanist Association. You say, humanist? What in the world? John Dewey was a congregationalist, so he, was, he grew up in a, a heretical Christian church that taught works, and he rejected, he eventually, his story is he rejected that false religion for something, a philosophy or a religion called humanism. A, a humanism written by John Dunphy in his award-winning essay, The Humanist, can be described as this. He writes this, he writes, A viable alternative to Christianity must be sought. That alternative is humanism. I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith, a religion, a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. 
These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers. For they will be ministers of another sort, utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey the humanist values in whatever subject they teach, regardless of the educational level. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new. I'd say the conflict is nearly over in the public school classroom. It's over. The rotting corpse, the class, the rotting corpse of Christianity, together with its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith of humanism. That, friends, is a declaration of war. And that happened nearly 100 years ago, and that war is pretty much done and lost. Humanism is the religion of the public school. And I want to explain to you, you say, what is humanism? What is humanism? Here's the actual definition of humanism. It's an outlook or system of thought. It's a religion, folks. Outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine, divine just God, or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress, now don't miss this, humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, common human needs, there's a lot to read between the lines here, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. First of all, they emphasize the potential value and goodness of human beings. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Are humans good? The potential value and goodness of human beings. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 12, the Bible says they are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. The Bible is the opposite of this. Humanism is in every way, I'm going to show you tonight, or today, the opposite of what the Bible teaches. It's not a little different. It's not, oh, they're just wrong in this area. It's the exact opposite of this book. You see how it says the potential value of human beings? They emphasize the common human needs. Where do you think they go with that? We'll get there in a few minutes. It's a worldview, folks. This is what I'm trying to get across. Okay? This humanism that is being taught in the public school, the public school is not just teaching certain things that are not according to the Bible. They are teaching an entire worldview. And it's a worldview that is exactly the opposite of the worldview that th this is a worldview. This book teaches you how to go to heaven. We go out with this book every Saturday and Sunday, and we show people the gospel that is in this book that tells about how God sent, you know, became a man and sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to take the punishment so we can, we can have a way to heaven because we're not good. We can't get to heaven. But it's also a worldview. This is why this country was founded by a lot of uh, heretical Christians. A lot of Calvinists founded this country. A lot of people that were... Uh, you know, just, they, they didn't really believe the correct doctrines of the Bible, but in large part, they held the worldview of the Bible to be true. They may not have had the correct gospel, they're still just as, as much in hell as an unbeliever, but at least they had the worldview correct for, for many years, many of them. Now, every subject in public school is pushing this worldview. I've seen it. I've seen it for 20 years. Because people know that I homeschool and I work with people. And people know that I homeschool and that I go to church and all these kinds of things. And they're constantly bringing me things and they're showing me. Look at what they're... My son, my oldest son was actually in public school for a couple years. And we saw what he brought home. In English, the paragraphs have this worldview. When they learn spelling and adjectives and, and punctuation, they're reading things that push the humanist worldview. It's crazy. You wouldn't believe it, but it's, it's, if I was a humanist, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Because they're so successful. Because what are, they, what are they doing? They're repeating. They're repeating. They're repeating. And if I tell a big enough lie, and I repeat it enough, eventually people will come to believe it. And it's working. And I'm going to show you that. So my worldview what, what is a worldview? My, my worldview defines how I interact with people. It defines, you know, how I lead my life. My worldview defines why I'm here today. 
My worldview is, is driving my life, my biblical worldview. Any worldview will drive your life. It will drive the, the life of your child when they grow up and when they get old. You know, it's basically the meaning of your life is your worldview. Okay, so let's look at this worldview. You say, you know, I don't believe you. Prove it. Let's look at some things. Here's a quote. Let's look at some results of this worldview in the public school. Here's a quote from the Humanist Manifesto. By the way, if you ever read any kind of book that says manifesto after it, it's probably some kind of lunatic. All right, I've read the Communist Manifesto. I tried to read Mein Kampf by, uh, by Adolf Hitler. I got about halfway through and I'm just like, whoa, you know, this guy's, I mean, the guy, is a, he was a madman, right? And he really did not like Jews. That was like for sure in, the, in, the, in Mein Kampf. But, you know, these manifestos, so the Humanist Manifesto, here's a quote. Religious humanists, see, they even call themselves religious humanists. Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. So they have a worldview, and they need to answer. They've replaced, they've taken creation of the Bible out. They need to have an answer for that. Right? They need to be able to answer where we came from. Otherwise, they have a big hole in their worldview. So this is why they marry so well with Charles Darwin. This is why they marry so well. We were just talking about this this morning. Charles Darwin and evolutionary teaching. Evolution, which I'm going to show you here, is just one result of the humanist worldview, of the humanist religion. There's many more. Evolution is one. Did you know that creationism is actually banned from public school? In 19, 1987, there was actually a Supreme Court case called Edwards versus Aguillard that banned the teaching of creation as a theory. Instead, it's evolutionary biology that is taught. But see, here's the thing. I don't want the public school teaching my kids anything about the Bible, first of all, right? I mean, this war's been gone for 50 years, in my opinion. However, evolution is as much of a religion, and humanism is as much of a religion as, as Christ, the Christianity of the Bible. So that's, it's, it's intellectually dishonest. Charles Darwin, he's a perfect answer for them. In 1809, he lived from 1809 to 1882. Now, Charles Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of the Species. The book is considered to be the cornerstone of modern evolutionary biology, even as I stand here and talk to you today. But did you know that the book is not really called The Origin of the Species? This is what kills me, and I have always been shocked about this for, for decades, that this, that this stuff is taught in public school. Because Charles Darwin was a pure, if there could be a pure racist, he was a pure racist because his, his teachings were rooted in racism. The book Origin of the Species, if you ever people say, oh, Origin of the Species, here's what it was actually called. It had a longer title that they always shorten up. The title was this, On the Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. The guy taught, and he, he taught that African people and the Aborigines in Australia were the missing link between man and ape. That's what he taught. And, and it caused, it, it's caused you know, millions of deaths because of this. So it's, it's not that it's just a teaching that doesn't matter, folks. Darwin said this, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. This is being taught in public school tomorrow. Every single day in this country. To people of all different nationalities. Let's put it that way, because I don't believe in race. The Bible says in Acts 17, 26, that God had made man of one blood all nations of men. That's it. There is no race according to the Bible. So once again, it's opposite of this. It's not a little different. It's the opposite of what this book says. So you say, what does it matter? What are the fruits? Well, here's where it leads. In Australia, let me read you a, a, a snippet from the Melbourne Review. When, Australian, when an Australian newspaper argued that the inexorable law of natural selection justifies exterminating the Australian and Maori races, these are like the Aborigines, that the world is better for it since failure to do so would be promoting the non-survival of the fittest, 
protecting the propagation of the imprudent, the diseased, the defective, and criminal. It was actually the Christian missionaries. That, that's Charles Darwin's theories were used by Europeans and whoever else to just massacre people. And it, we need to promote the, the survival of the fittest. So if I'm strong enough to kill you, then I'm the fit and you're the unfit. That's basically what it boils down to. It was the Christian missionaries who raised objection to these types of things, always. Look, it, it's shocking that this is being taught to kids of all different nationalities in school. The theory of evolution and its acceptance has led also to a wonderful new branch of science called eugenics. Now, eugenics. What in the world is eugenics? Here's the definition of eugenics. The science of improving human, the human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable, heritable characteristics. Now, to give you an example of this, um, I used to do this. I, we raised sheep and we had registered sheep. We used to do this to, uh, it was a science. We would measure traits of the animals and we would measure, the two traits that I measured with all of our sheep was a uh, mother's ability to wean twins and the growth rate of the lambs. We measured lambs. I needed to know how much weight every lamb would put on every day of the first 60 days of its life. We were constantly weighing lambs. It was crazy. Garrett loves to weigh lambs. <laughs> because if we had a mother who could not wean twins and she could not produce lambs that would grow at over a pound a day, down the road she went. It's harsh, but they're animals, right? That's the difference. My father-in-law was a cattle rancher in western North Dakota for almost 40 years. He was known to have some of the best Angus cattle in the state. People would buy his cattle without even seeing them because he did selective breeding and he was very good at managing, managing his animals. Now look, it's more than just creation, folks. It's a mindset that we're just another animal on this planet. Do you see where this leads? Now, turn to 1 Samuel 16. Let's look at what the Bible says about this. It's all branching from this humanist religion. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel will be those first one and two books in the Old Testament. Now this is a, the prophet Samuel. He goes to Jesse, the son of David, and he is told by God to go and anoint a new king. Saul is out of the picture, and he goes to, to Jesse, and Jesse has several sons, eight sons. And he starts looking at um, Jesse's sons, and the first son walks by, and he's like, he's this tall you know, handsome young man, and, and surely this is, the, this is our new king. Because if you remember, um, Saul, the reason that people wanted Saul, because he was head and shoulders above the people, right? He was this tall stature of a man, and he was strong, and he was, he was stronger and, you know, better than all the other people, and that's what the people wanted, right? Let's look at what God looks for. In 1 Samuel 16, in verse 7, the Bible says, after Jesse's first son walks by, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on what? The heart. You ever met a kid with Down syndrome? You'll, you'll, you'll never find kids that are, that are nicer and have a, have, a, have a nicer heart towards people than handicapped children. You know, it's the strong that are the arrogant. But what does God look on? God looks on the heart. One of my favorite people in this world is a young man who had medical trouble when he was, you know, in his, his late teens. And he's probably never going to be able to run or play basketball, or football, but the, the kid's got a heart that's like this big. He serves the Lord like, like nobody I've ever seen. It's crazy. 
If, if the measure of your heart is what you end up being in heaven, that kid's going to be 12 feet tall Amen. when I see him in heaven. That is the opposite of what they are teaching in public school. That we are all a bunch of animals and that people have potential value. No, God looks on the heart, folks. You say human selective breeding, that's crazy. No one would ever actually do that. Well, the Nazis did it. The Nazis had programs that were trying to create the perfect race of superhuman Aryans or whatever you call them. The Nazis did it. Did you know that in China, in India, there's on low estimates, there is 23 million missing girls. Because in China, you can have one kid, or you have to pay heavy taxes, or they even force abortions on people if you don't have enough money. There's 23 million at low estimates. I've heard it as high as 100. Because everybody wants the boy, so they abort the girls. So there's this huge lopsided gender gap in the population. There's 23 million, you, you, that's, that's, selective, that's selective abortion, folks. It's, it's wicked as hell, and, it's, and it's, this, it's this idea that we're all a bunch of animals, and, and there's no different, and we have no inherent value. Because if we have inherent value, who do we have inherent value to? To God. Because God looks on the heart. He doesn't look on how, you know, how tall you are or how, how fast you can run. Let me introduce you to somebody else. This is a real peach here. Margaret Sanger, she lived from 1879 to 1966. She was an American birth control activist, sex educator, writer, and nurse. She has heavily influenced the public school system. She's the founder of Planned Parenthood, who is the number one abortion provider in the United States. She has heavy influence, Planned Parenthood now has heavy, heavy influence on all kinds of, of uh, organizations, including the Girl Scouts of America that are many times tied into the public school system. Do you see how it's all connected? Margaret Sanger, she, she said this, before eugenicists and others who are laboring for racial betterment, there it is again, she's a racist too. She said, she had statements, many different quotes that I couldn't even have time to read on how that she wanted to exterminate the black populations in inner cities through abortion and selective birth control. Before eugenicists and others who are labor, laboring for racial betterment can succeed, they must first clear the way for birth control. Like the advocates of birth control, the eugenicists, for instance, are seeking to assist the race towards the elimination of the unfit. Birth control itself, by freeing the reproductive instinct from its present chains, will make a better race. Eugenics, eugenics without birth control seems to us as a house built upon the sands. And she even uses some Bible reference here. It is at the mercy of the rising stream. It is at the mercy of the rising stream of the unfit if there's not birth control. One of the most enthusiastic supporters of the eugenics in the pages of the Birth Control Review, who Margaret Sanger um, was one of the leaders of, was Professor Ernst Rudin, Adolf Hitler's director of genetic sterilization and founder sterilization and founder of the Nazi Society for Racial Hygiene. In fact, Rudin's boss, Adolf Hitler, avidly read American eugenics journals and developed his ideas of an Aryan master race from their writers. You see how it's all connected? Am I getting this across? How it's all connected, it starts at the top, and it's people pushing these humanist ideas, and it's all connected, and it filters down. Abortion is the ultimate birth control, and it targets minority communities. If you look at you know, the percentage of abortions, it's working. The percentage of abortions amongst minorities in the United States is much higher than their actual population. It all stems from this godless worldview of humanism. It's being taught to children across this country is accepted fact. The next thing that humanists produce, socialism. Socialist thoughts. Socialism many times disguised as environmentalism. And I'm going to show you this connection. First of all, I'm not for trash and air pollution, okay? My, one of my pet peeves, even when I was out in the middle of nowhere on the farm, was trash in the ditch. I, I hated it. But you know what? I got news for you, liberal California. Your state is covered in trash. 
So whatever you're doing is not working. But that's not what environmentalism about, is about. Environmentalists, here's, here's more from the Humanist Manifesto. One of, their, one of their doctrines. A socialized and cooperative economic order must be established to the end that equitable, dis, equitable distribution of the means of life as po be possible. Humanists demand a shared life in a shared world. You think this environmental movement is a joke? You laugh it off when you hear the climate change or global warming or whatever, you laugh it off? I'm telling you, turn to Matthew 24. And I've seen this personally. I worked in the power generation industry for over 10 years, and I have sat in conferences and I have listened to scientists talk about how the global problem of climate change is really about how the wealthy nations need to abandon their technology and, and pay for the development of the lower country. We wreck the world. It's only fair that since we put all the carbon in the air, that we would help them develop their countries with our wealth. It's, it's socialism at the core. I'm not saying that environmentalists aren't the useful idiots of these top socialists, but it's, it ends at socialism when you get to the top, which is, you know, ends up as communism. In Matthew 24, look what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 24, starting in verse number 3. Let's start up in verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came into him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now listen to this right here. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Turn to Genesis 8 and verse number 22. Now what do, you, what, what do you hear whenever we have hurricanes and, you know, if there's a really bad hurricane season, what do you, what do you hear in the news? What are people writing about in the articles? We did this. We're causing this. It's because we have too many cars on the road is why we had an earthquake. That's what they are saying. And I'm telling you, this is going to get worse. The Bible says that there's going to be more storms and more earthquakes and more of all these things. So what do you think that is going to, they're going to be saying at the top, these wicked people in high places? It's, it's all going to be driven to the end. Now let me just prove um, all of this wrong for you. In Genesis 8, in chapter 22, let me turn there. Noah just got off the ark, and God's making some promises. Okay? God just destroyed the world with a flood. He killed everybody except Noah and his family and all the animals. And in Genesis 8 and verse number 22, the Bible says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So we're not going to end this thing with our SUVs. God will end it. He has promised never to make the season stop, never to make the plant stop growing. God is going to decide when it ends, and if you read the book of Revelation and study that, you will see how it's going to end in exactly that way. But here's my theory. Here's my theory. This will be used to enter us into a global government and global decisions. It will be environmentalism that is used. And you say, prove it. Now, this is my opinion. We're entering into Jared's opinion world here because we're talking about Bible prophecy. Turn to Revelation 13. The Bible talks about a guy who's going to come and he's going to unite the world. Now, think about how hard that task is if we just look at it right now. That means you have to get all of these countries, China, Russia, the United States, to basically give up their national sovereignty. How are you going to do that? In Revelation 13, let's start reading it in just the first verse. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like, excuse me, like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. 
and his mouth is the mouth of the lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. This is talking about the Antichrist of the end times. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given him unto him to continue, forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. There's your world government right there. He's got power of the entire world. And I believe that this is how this will happen if, if it happens in, our, you know, in, the, in the near term. Because if, if it comes to pass that these things do get worse and the hurricanes get worse and the earthquakes get worse, we've all got to come together. We've got to save this earth. We've, we've all got to stop thinking about only our interests as the United States. We've got to give this sovereignty over to somebody who can take control. It makes perfect sense to me. And I, I can see it. If it happens in the next hundred years, I can see this is how it's happening. I don't know when it's going to happen. Nobody knows, right? Now look, it, it's, it's already being used to, to scare um, people into this. You will find that kids that come out of high school, kids that, uh, I've seen it. I've, I've given tours to high school groups of, of power facilities, and all they care about is that, we're, that they're, they're up at night because they're worried we're ruining the earth. It's being taught and preached in public school. And this is what it could be used for, folks. It's very dangerous. Plus, it teaches you to worship the earth. It teaches you to worship the creature more than the creator. And it, it finally, at the top, like I've told you, it leads to global socialism. I've seen it personally. Now, let's look at public school and let's look at the influences from other people in the public school. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We see how the religion of humanism, it branches into evolution. It branches into eugenics, biology. It branches into all these wicked philosophies, all these wicked branches of this same philosophy, but it all comes from the same place. Removing God and in, in putting in the religion of humanism into the public school. While you turn there, let me re read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, where the Bible says, Wherefore come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. Look, we are to be separate. It doesn't make any, se any sense that our kids would just be with everybody else. They're the weak ones. They're the ones that need us to be, like, we're, we're, whenever the Bible talks about kids, it's about training them. It's about bringing them up. It's about nurturing them. It's never about sending them out to fight this battle. Uh, many, many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention came out with this philosophy that they're not going to direct their members to pull, and I'm not endorsing anything about the Southern Baptist Convention, but they, they're not going to pull, endorse their members to pull kids out of public school because their kids will be an influence on those kids in the public school. Wrong! How was Jehoshaphat an influence on Ahab? He went along with him. The worst kid in the class influences everybody else. The worst kid in the gang influences everyone else. That's the way it works, folks. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at the, the, type of, the type of things that you will deal with when you get sent out into the world. Paul says this, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes, meaning people whipping you stripes, above measure. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times I received forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. They thought he was dead, remember? Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, he's being betrayed by everybody, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Does this sound like a job for kids? Does this sound like something you want to send kids into? That's why the Bible says train them up. And when they are old, Paul was strong. He was an adult. He was old. 
He was able to handle this. He was able to handle all this. In Ephesians 6 verses, 6, verses 4, the Bible says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Not sending them out to be eaten by wolves. Now, let's look at you know, some things that are out there. What, what are out there? You know, they're going to deal with drugs. People that are doing drugs in school. They're going to deal with alcohol. People that are doing alcohol in school. Fornication is rampant in the public school system. These things are normalized in the public school. If you've been to public school, you know. You know that I still remember that feeling when I went into high school and I'm like, whoa! My sister, my sister, I still remember my sister telling me, oh yeah, so-and-so does this, and so-and-so, and I'm just like, whoa, people do this? But guess what? By the time you're in high school, by the time you graduate from high school, it's normal. That's just the way it goes. People just do those things. It becomes normal. And it's, it's, it's wicked. These things, God forbid any kids in this room ever get normalized to these serious, wicked sins. They're life destroying sins. You, you talk about drugs. I've never learned so much about drugs since I moved to California. I mean, people tell me, there's dr you, you do drugs one time, and you're hooked. You do some of these drugs. You do them two or three times, you get them from the wrong people, you're dead. Or you can no longer think anymore. That, I, I almost quit talking to the homeless people in Sacramento. You can't make any... They're, they're gone. They're gone. Their mind is, is destroyed. And I actually talked to one guy one time that walked by the church, because I was curious about you know the clinic he was going to and what kind of drugs he was getting there, and told us all about it. He said he did it one time, and done, stuck. Now he's, he's in a, living in a culvert. It's crazy. You, you, <laughs> they shouldn't be there, folks. Be ye separate. I mean, hello. Separate is not together. Look, it's a poor education, even by secular standards. 20% of high school students that graduate can't even read. They're functionally illiterate. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. See what the Bible says about education. Proverbs chapter 2. <clears throat> and then we'll see why the public school has no wisdom. There can't be any there, literally. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6. Right in the center of your Bible, you'll be in the book of Psalms, and then one book over is the book of Proverbs. The Bible says in Proverbs 2, 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Amen. Proverbs 16, 16, I'll just read for you. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. And here's the big one, my favorite. Turn to Proverbs 9, just a few over, a few pages over. And this one's repeated a few times in the book of Proverbs. But Proverbs 9, verse 10, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's why there can be no wisdom in the public school. If you take God out of it, there is no wisdom, there is no knowledge. That's why you're, you're into all this weird stuff that you and I look at and we hear these things and we're like, whoa, how could people believe that, that stuff? Because we have the Bible. Look, there's no wisdom without the Lord, folks. That's the bottom line. I gave a, a sermon, uh, I don't have this in my notes, but I gave a sermon a couple times, uh, or not a couple times, uh, a year ago maybe, on, on going to college and why I'm not going to send my kids to college. And one of my fears about that sermon was that people would use that sermon to get, you know, to not to think that education isn't important. Education is very important to me. You know, I believe that a, that a homeschooling mother and a homeschooling family should push hard to give their kids the, the highest level of education that is possible, which is very, very high. I mean, homeschool kids, there's some very highly educated homeschool kids. And this isn't really a, a sermon on homeschooling, but look, the goal should be a great education with a biblical worldview. Amen. So, you know, college classes are not bad if you're, you're learning some, you know, technical trades and things like that and you're in those classes at home. We do that in our family. They're, they're very highly useful classes. They're based in math and trade skills and things like that. This is good. 
But there is no knowledge in the public education system. And, you know, look, but let me just say this. A poor homeschool education is better than any kind of public education. So if you decide to homeschool and you're just no good at it, it's better than putting your kids in the public school. Let me give you some stats on homeschoolers. You say, oh, you know, that sounds difficult and we don't know if I have the money and I didn't, I'm not educated myself. The National Homeschool Research Institute reports that children who are educated at home typically score uh, 15 to 30 percent higher than public school students on standardized academic achievement tests. You know, this isn't a shocker to most people. I mean, homeschooling has gotten a reputation, you know, where employers were actually, will actually at this point be like, you were homeschooled? Great! I've seen it a hundred times. Because certain things come with the homeschool kid and certain key things just come. There's trends that are easily recognizable at this point. It's been going on for long, for long enough. This is true of students, by the way, who are taught by parents with or without a formal education. These statistics are true across the board regardless of the formal education, college, whatever, of the mother. Because generally people will say, oh yeah, well you need to have a college degree if you're going to teach your kids and all that. No. The statistics do not show that at all. Also, these results are consistent across economic lines. Meaning if you're poor, you're middle class, you're upper class, it doesn't matter. The, the, the lower income homeschooler gets, is scoring just as high as the other ones. And here's, and here's part of the reason why. The public school spends on average $12,500 per student. It's crazy. The homeschool average is about $600 per year versus $12,500. That's your government at work, folks. You know, look, let's look at um, violence in the public school. Every month, 282,000 physical assaults happen in public schools. 282,000. 10% of high school students are sexually assaulted in their high school. 89% of high school students are sexually harassed, meaning verbal um, harassment. 25% of college girls are sexually assaulted. That's one in four. So if you make it through high school, you know, you're probably still in trouble in college. If, if, and if, it's funny, we drove by uh, Fresno State a couple days ago, and it was at night, and you see nothing but blue lights. There's all these blue lights. Has anyone seen this? There's like a blue light every 50 yards. And Garrett's like, Garrett and, and Jacob are like, what are, those, what are all those blue lights? I'm like, well, that's what, because when you're a woman and you get attacked, that's, that's where you call the police. Because Apparently that's, and I agree, according to these statistics, that's probably the most dangerous place for a woman to be walking around in the whole city. Right there. 25%, folks. Look, this is how your daughters will be treated. 89% of, of girls in high school are sexually harassed and 10% are assaulted. This is how your girls will be treated in high school. This is how your boys will learn how to treat girls. Treat women. Because you know what? If you, you come up with a big enough lie and you repeat it enough, people will start to believe it. If your daughter is surrounded by people that dress like whores and she's treated like a whore by every boy in her class, uh, again and again and again and again, what do you think is going to happen? And you all that went to public school, you know what I'm saying is true. Why in the world would you even think about putting your kids in this type of situation? If you repeat a lie enough, guys and gals, they'll believe it. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's talk about some application here. What do you do? What do you do? How do you do this? It's intimidating. There's a lot of young kids in here. It's intimidating. How, how do I homeschool? I don't know how to do that. How do I get, how do I make this happen in my family? And there's a lot to this, guys. And there's a lot to this, ladies. But let me just give you some, some, over, some overreaching um, ideas to think about. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 10, I hope that this verse when I read it to you means something different now, that you've heard all the things that I've told you. The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. 
which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. If you try to raise kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and you send them to public school and they become worldly and they leave and you lose your children to the world, they become drug addicts, they become whatever, they get themselves into sins or troubles that can't be reversed. Because many of these things that I told you about, they can't be undone. Diseases and you know addictions and all these different things, they can't be undone. They could, they could be a life sentence, some of these things. You will be pierced through with many sorrows. And the odds are severely against you. Look, guys, it can be done. I know it's intimidating. It can be done. I have personally worked two jobs for over 15 years. It can be done. You get used to it. You get used to it. You just work. I'm doing two things now. You can do it. There's time in the day. We're going to talk next week about media, TV, internet. And you know what? Here's a nice thing. If you do this right, you won't have any time for any of that. I never had time for TV. All these idiots that you see watching football games, I'm like, what in the world? Who has time to watch a four-hour football game? It's crazy. I mean, if you're going to be a single-income family, I mean, you don't have time for these types of stupid things. I never had time for it. So it's going to fix things for you. And, and you know what? It, it's, it can be done. There's a lot of hours in the week. It can be done. I'm trying to encourage you. People do it. And you know what? You start learning to be responsible with your money, and you'll be shocked how far you can stretch a buck. Most people waste all their money. You know, you'd be shocked. You just start putting your money in the right places and being smart about it. It can be done. Guys, it can be done. We will help you. People have done it before you. You are not the first one blazing this trail. It can be done. Okay, so I just want to encourage you there. Ladies, I don't know how. Where do I start? I'm confused by it. I'll tell you. All the curriculums and all the stuff, it's confusing. It's crazy. All the different things that my wife has put together. But here's the beauty, ladies. There's people that have blazed the trail in front of you. There's people in this church who have successfully homeschooled children. They will help you. They will help you. There's homeschool seminars. This church will have a homeschool group. It's a top priority. It will have a homeschool group where you will be able to get the kids together. And I mean, look at how antisocial these kids are. It's stupid. <laughs> stupid. It's always been the stupidest argument to me. They're, they're, I, you know, I've always, uh, another thing, I always survey kids. If I ever go out soul winning at different churches and there's ever a, a young man or a young lady in our soul winning group, I always ask them, because they're always homeschooled, right? I always ask them, here's another thing to think about. I always ask them, hey, do you like being homeschooled? Would you rather go to public school? You know how many times someone has told me that they would rather go to public school? Never! Not even one time. Not once. In almost 10 years. They love it. They're wired to want to be with their mother. It's hardwired. It's awesome. People will help you. And when you're starting out, you say, I don't know how to do high school calculus. Does your four-year-old start in high school calculus? No. Right? I had to relearn math when Garrett and the, some of the kids got older. I just, you just relearn it real quick, but you start out when they're five. You know what? I can read a five-year-old's book. I can. I'm proud to say. So you learn with them. You become smarter. You know, you get, a, you get another education yourself. Look, and here's, a, here's a, another thing that you'll see. God will bless you in this plan. God will make things work out for you. If you are working hard as a wife to educate your children, if you are working hard as a husband to support your wife and to support your children in that goal, God will bless that plan and you will see those movements in your life. And it's a beautiful thing, folks. 
You will never see God working in your life more than when you start making moves like this for Him. And He will take care of it. He will give your wife the strength she needs. He will give you the strength you need. He, he will take care of it. He will bless that plan, folks. Look, it's all about the worldview. Do you get it? It's all about the worldview. 14,000 hours. People lose their kids because of a worldview. That's why. That's it. It's about the worldview. Who's going to train your kids? Is it going to be you? You know, I would sacrifice everything, folks. I would sacrifice everything to, to keep this going in my family, to, to keep this going. It, it'll, be, it'll have generational effects. If you do it correctly, you and your wife work in this area, God blesses that plan. Your, grandchi your grandchildren will be homeschooled because of this. The war in the public school is lost. All right? Don't give me this. I go to a small town public school. It's a centralized machine. You can't change it. It is designed so you can't change it. I have sat on school boards. You can't change it. It's the same in the small town. I, I, 600 people was the town we were next to. Same. Same wickedness, same garbage, same everything. It's the same. There's just, there's just more people here. That's it. But it's the same. You know why it's the same? Because it's the same worldview. Does it make sense now? It's a centralized machine. It's designed at the top. You can't change it from the local level. Look, the country was not founded to be that way. The country was supposed to have local control of things. The Constitution laid out what the federal government could do. Everything else was supposed to be handled at the local level. So if it's the same thing, it's kind of the same concept of the independent church. Is that the, the, the states and the counties and the cities that had morals that, that still held the biblical worldview could, could hang on to it longer. But look, it's a centralized machine. The war's over, the war's lost. Don't put your kids in there. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for all these things that you teach us. We thank you for the worldview that you put forth in the Bible. Lord, help us value all the, all the children in this room, Lord, and help us understand the wickedness that is after them. And help the, Lord, I, I pray for the fathers and the mothers in this room that you give them strength and you give them the heart that they need to protect these kids from what's out there. Lord, we love you. Please bless the soul winning this afternoon and church this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.